Upwards to the vanguard, where the pressure is so high, under the microscope, hope against hope. John Gennaro, count me in! Today's first words belong to The Flaming Lips, Oklahoma City's own from Race for the Prize off their 1999 LP, The Soft Bulletin, but the rest of them belong to me. Welcome to Divine Intervention, a self-help podcast about basketball. My name is Dan Devine, and before we get started, here are three things I am grateful for today. Number one, I get paid by Yahoo Sports to write about the NBA and talk about it into this microphone and into that camera. Pretty good deal. Number two, we actually got some snow here in Brooklyn, New York, after something like 700 days without an inch of it, which means alternate side parking is suspended for today, which means I don't have to move my car this morning, which means right now, currently, I feel dominant and ungovernable. And number three, just as important as all of that, I get to spend part of my morning with perhaps the most electrifying man in sports writing entertainment today. My guest is a tremendous writer whose work I first encountered more than a decade ago at Baller Ball, a sports blog dedicated to the tripartite <laughs> premise that basketball is fun, basketball is funny, and basketball tells a story. Pretty good premise. These days, he's a staff writer at The Ringer, where he has given us mind-melting prose about topics including but not limited to the art of passing, the defense of OG Ananobi, the power of Garth Brooks, and the comedy of Joe Para. He is also the author of a novel called A Little Blood and Dancing, BAM, which hit bookstores, libraries, and e-readers and audiobook purveyors last summer and is next up on my nightstand. I promise I'm getting there next. Most relevant for our purposes today, he is a native of the great state of Oklahoma who has long harbored great affection for and paid close attention to the Oklahoma City Thunder. Friends, a warm welcome for Tyler Parker. Tyler, thank you so much for being here today. How are you doing? Dude, Dan, I mean, I, you, you, John was not lying. What a, that's, <laughs> I'm going to clip that out and like use that as my resume. Um, that's, uh, that's incredible. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, th that's all uh, wildly undeserved, but you're so sweet for saying it. And uh, I'm, yeah, I'm stoked. Uh, I'm stoked to be here. The upwards to the vanguard. That's what, a, I mean, a, a baller ball mention is blowing my mind, truly. <laughs> well, one of the benefits of having been doing this for a while is that you've aged into the place where you actually remember a bunch of shit. So it's like <laughs> right. like when uh, I, uh, Pina, Michael Pina, also uh, of, of The Ringer, um, when he was on, I was like, yeah, I remember reading your, word your WordPress blog, Shaky Ankles, and his eyes got saucer wide. Like, yeah. oh, my God, before we even were doing this as jobs. I, that, that, it, it's... I remember writing like four pieces a week for that baller ball thing, like waking up like at like 530 before work and cranking out just some undoubtedly god awful bullshit about <laughs> like Tyreek Evans or something. And yeah, that uh, cuts in the cage, man, cuts in the cage. But yeah, that's blast from the past. Thank you for that. My pleasure. Also, uh, the, you know, the under the aegis of our friend Jason Gallagher. Uh, yes, on, on, the so great talk, Jason Gallagher. Talk about upwards to the vanguard, man, like running the uh, JJ Reddick media <laughs> empire out here. But uh, so, yeah, many years ago, many moons. But uh, I have asked you here today, Tyler, not only to talk about ball or ball, um, but because when crafting topics for upcoming shows, super producer John Gennaro and I settled on the following complicated and nuanced notion. Holy shit, the thunder. <laughs> And given some of the wonderful things that you have written about the team and its players over the years and how hard you lean into the fun of all of this stuff, I could think of nobody else that I'd rather discuss all of it with than you. And we will get there. We're about to get there. But first, here on Divine Intervention, we always try to operate from a place of joy. So, Tyler Parker, what is something from the world of basketball that has been giving you joy this week? So, I'm going to go Kobe White. And I and I don't know I, I don't know if it's like, if there's too much Kobe White in the world right now and it's just gonna fall on deaf ears. But there, like, I I can't get enough. And the uh, the way that he has completely elevated things in Chicago, just from an aesthetics perspective, honestly, <laughs> like just. Purely as like, oh, the Bulls are on. This might actually be kind of fun. Right. You know what I mean? Like it, it th there's, he's had, I mean, a couple handfuls of plays that stand out. I mean, the, the two that for whatever reason are in my head right now, 
he had a play against the Rockets where he got like he got Simgun isoed on him and just like basically like gave him the full menu of like <laughs> handle and went by him and hits Caruso for a three in the corner. And it was just one of those, like, increasingly, like, with every crossover, the Bulls announcers are getting more and more unhinged, you know? <laughs> and, like, you feel Stacey King, like, undoing the top button on his shirt, like, the, you know, as he's going by Shingun. is fantastic. And then, I mean, he had a there, – there, there was a run in the first half against the Warriors the other night and that loss they had to the Warriors. But it, it culminated in right before the half, he hits a, you know, Steph-ish 30-footer at the buzzer. And it kind of weirdly felt like a moment. Like, in, like watching it sort of, you're just like, man, this is – it's really Kobe White time right now. You know what I mean? <laughs> like this is, this is moving beyond kind of a little – blip in the NBA sphere like he's put together a little run here that's been extremely (laughs) consistent and fun and I'm just I'm stoked I'm yeah first of all I love that you're you preface this by saying there might be too much Kobe White out there like I, this is perhaps indications of bubbles that we live in in the world. Like, I guarantee you, if you went up to anybody else in the world and was like, is there too much Kobe White out there for you right now? Then you go like, who are you? Who are you talking about? <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, you're right. Yes. But you're absolutely right. Like, this went from a story that was, okay, Zach Levine's out, so somebody else is going to have to cook a little bit to like, no, you need to now figure out in what, like, how things work around Kobe White. For this Bulls team, like since the beginning of December, he's at like 22 and a half points, six rebounds, six assists. He's shooting 42 percent from three. And as you said, like on increasingly more audacious shots and like the kind of of playmaking selection befitting uh, his just sort of general, you know, joie de vivre, like the the vibe of his play. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, if you can do that on volume with everything continuing to kind of feel good, then, yeah, maybe you're not just like well, we can't figure out what to do with that guy and he's the sixth man and maybe yeah, he's just like a fun sideline. Like maybe you actually have to figure out how to build things around him, which further complicates every complicated thing already in terms of how the Bulls navigate their backcourt. But that's like a bigger picture idea. The general point of we find sources of joy and like su- surprise from surprising places all over the NBA every night. That's kind of what you have to do to keep doing this on a night to night basis for, you know, year after year. And Kobe White going from like, I don't know if that guy's ever going to make it to he is cooking like all stars out in space on the regular is kind of a wild and wonderful one. It's great. I think it's going to like or ho- hopefully it it makes, you know, like. Us people like us fans more patient with some of these dudes going forward where it's like you're not so quick to call a dude because nobody would have called white a bust or anything like that but you but you 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 would have also said oh maybe he's not maybe he has not yet had the career that we would have hoped for taking him that high right but to see him able to turn into this at this point so many years into his career it does just sort of make you think like, okay, like what are other guys that right now, either because of dudes ahead of them in the lineup or just, you know, like the stars haven't aligned right yet. Who's, who's an injury away from taking this kind of leap themselves. It's, I, 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 I found that as he continued to have success, it just sort of started to make me go like, well, what if they had traded him and then this just he blossoms somewhere else, you know, right. and then it like it, it, uh, it. Um, yeah, it's it's been it's been so fun to watch him get to initiate so often and that that since Levine has come back, it's nice that it, the white renaissance has not stopped. You know what I mean? There hasn't been like some like, oh, OK, like, let's get back to normal here. You know, right. The only thing I'm going to ask for us to clip out of that is the white renaissance. And we're going to hang on to that and just use that as a stinger. Uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Every time I make like, a particularly good point, I'm not sure. We're, we're not sure what we're going to use it for, but we're going to it's going to be important. Um, right. But also yeah, to, to your broader point, like I because I, I've been guilty of that where I'm like, I don't know. It's called, like Kobe White's four years in and like he's been like a decent bench. I don't know. He's 23 years old. Like uh, right. 
if if uh, if the world had given up on many of us at 23 years old, uh, <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. would not would not be be bringing you the, this this delightful content today. Um, I love that Kobe White. This is the longest we've, we've talked about Kobe White, but there's too much Kobe White out there, so we're gonna have to cut it short there. <laughs> um, Tyler, I've brought you here today to talk about the Thunder. Uh, before we get into this year's model, which is fascinating and wonderful, and I want to discuss at length, uh, I want to go back a little bit, kind of try to trace the arc of how we get here. Um, right. So, like, Oklahoma City becomes an NBA city, an NBA place. Like 2005, 2006, Hurricane Katrina displaces the the Hornets and need a place to to play. And like parts of two seasons there, it's like, oh, this actually this could work. Like there there's sports loving fan base there, obviously from Oklahoma State and the Oklahoma Sooners, and there's you know there's a, a ready made audience there. Maybe this could really be an NBA market. Um, which then sadly leads to the zero sum game of Clay Bennett brings the Sonics to Oklahoma City in 2008. And at, the, at that point, you're, you know, a young sports fan in Oklahoma. I'm just wondering, like, what do you remember about sort of the transition to Oklahoma City being like an NBA place? Like, oh, shit, we actually are an NBA place. I, I remember just like it was really just pure excitement, honestly. Like there was there was there was um, when the Hornets were around like i mean we 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 i grew up like far from the city like mm-hmm. two and a half three hours away and so it wasn't like a regularity to go to go up there or anything but i specifically remember going with a bunch of school friends to go watch a mavericks uh hornets game and we sat on the very top row um because those were the seats that that, that we could afford and uh and i just remember thinking like this is unbelievable that there's an NBA team down there on the floor, like the, and, the, and that like Dirk came here to our town. Right. This is crazy. Um, and yeah. And the, I mean, and then when the, when the, when the thunder got there, I remember not caring at all how bad they were and being excited that there were some like young dudes already there that had shown enough that you could be, pumped up about the possibility of, you know, you didn't, you didn't know. I don't think anybody thought, oh, they'll be in the, you know, NBA finals in four years or right. whatever. But it, but it, but there was like a, oh, there's, we have Durant here when Russ arrived. Okay. We've got these two guys who are worth following. And like, clearly there's something here, De- varying degrees of it, especially early on. You didn't know that Russ was going to get to what he became. And, Durant from jump, you know, you were just sort of like, oh, okay, like I see how this works. Like I see how this uh, ramps up into something, you know, really scary. And so, yeah, it was, it was just pure elation and just, you're, you, you were so excited that like something that previously felt like, um, something you would have to like go on vacation to do to go see an NBA game. You know what I mean? Is now, Oh shit. Like, you know, I went to, I went to, I, I, uh, went to college like 30 minutes outside of the city and every now and again, you could go in and watch a game. You know, it was fun to be able to go and see Kobe if he was in, you know, like, like that, 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 that was an option uh just as an entertainment in general you were just like this is insane i can't believe it's also like oh wow these games are just on cable i can just watch these games right. you know what i mean like i didn't I, I couldn't afford league pass at the time and so i was like keeping up with the league like probably a lot of other people just nationally televised games some illegal streams here and there right and then like you're <laughs> you're looking at box scores the next day And, um, I, yeah, I just, I, I remember sitting there in college and watching games just on like, you know, Tuesdays and Wednesday nights with my buddies and thinking like, this is incredible that we have NBA programming just on our cable here. I remember thinking specifically that was, uh, that was just a top flight entertainment for me. Yeah, yeah, it's not, I mean, it's, you know, 
uh, to transition from like the best damn sports show period or whatever to like, oh, there's like a live actual game <laughs> happening on this network. <laughs> it's pretty great. Well, and like something that is typically like you're going to watch like, you know, uh, you know, uh, I think it was the Fox Sports Network. Like you're going to watch like OU Texas Tech, like baseball or something before that. or whatever. <laughs> right. Like, you know what I mean? Like the, 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 the programming wasn't exactly sterling. And so it, uh, yeah, whenever, um, <laughs> you know, once Earl Watson got to town, things really started, <laughs> things really started looking up, you know? <laughs> well, Earl Watson, of course, yeah, he's sort of the John the Baptist figure that we've all we've all talked about a lot, bring, bringing the good news of what was to come uh, into town. Um, but yeah, from there, you know, the Thunder become, you know, not just the team on the local package. They become the team you've got to program on the national games because they're so frigging good. You know, the there's the you know, they bring the pre-existing core of, you know, Kevin Durant from the Sonics and then that first draft of like Russell Westbrook and Serge Ibaka. 2009, James Harden comes and you got like. This it's all happening. It's all here. And from there, as you mentioned, the stations of the NBA cross, right? Like 50 win season, you play the Lakers in the first round, you lose to them, but you put up a good showing. They go on to win the title. 55 win season, get to the conference finals, lose to the Mavs. Good showing. They go on to win the title. Play it like a 58 or 59 win pace in the lockout season. Make it to the finals. Be, you know, lose to the Heat. They win the title. But you're like, you're seeing this. The, the growth in real time and you're seeing the investment and the faith you put into these young players sort of all blossom. And, you know, we know where it goes from there. And but like, I was like, what do you when you think back on that time, like before it starts to unwind and things start to change so much, like. I know you're yeah, you're somebody who thinks so much about being like the joy and the playfulness of it all. Like, what was it like to watch that young core kind of grow? It, I, now you now it's much easier to remember th the good t times than it is the like little ones. Like if you had asked me in 2017, I would have had sure. a very, I would have had a very quick laundry list for you <laughs> of the way hey. of the ways that things went wrong. Um, and I'm sure if we talked long enough here, I could get back to the list, <laughs> but, it, <laughs> but like I, th the thing that I remember the most about them was sort of how overwhelming the athleticism could be whenever they would every now and again get into one of those like surge at the five kind of lineups and you would see this i mean those the when 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 harden was still there but even after even after harden left like some of those russ and kd teams whenever they would get in transition and they were getting out in passing lanes and getting deflections. And when the defense was like on point and the screws were tight, they could get out in transition so quickly and things could avalanche on the other team so, so fast that it was, as a fan, like those moments of, oh, we're on a run and oh, wait, it's just not stopping. You know what right. I mean? Like I, I remember in those that first Lakers uh, series in 2010, in those games three and four, there were different points where the crowd was so loud. I was watching those games on TV, but the crowd was so loud and it was so unexpected that the Thunder were not just giving the Lakers like a tough matchup, but also like running them off the floor in 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 these two games. I just remember feeling so much like so happy and not even understanding how it's happening. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Like at that, at that point, there were still so many flaws with the team and really throughout the time that the Thunder, you know, were, were a big time contender. There were always flaws, right? There was like shooting was always an issue. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, late game offense could get uh, really uh, crunchy and into the grind and um, uh, predictable. And the and you know there's all the Kendrick Perkins lineup snafus and everything else right like all that stuff where you're just like why won't we just put Durant at the five what are we doing or like you know <laughs> right <laughs> like all the all the little fan stuff where you're just imagining like maybe Sam will get tired of Scott Brooks this year <laughs> oh no we got an okay he's got. <laughs> Still got, uh, still got a uh, little more <laughs> rope left on the leash. Uh, all right, 
Um, but uh, I'm sorry, I'm rambling. Uh, the the yeah, I I just I remember I remember thinking I can't believe that they're this good already, and it does start to like rejigger your brain a little bit in terms of oh, I thought that. I thought that we were further away. You know what I mean? And and so it's like that kind of, it's that fun moment. Like I love the, the stations of the NBA cross is a fantastic turn of phrase by you. And, and like that, I, I love the, the idea of like, like you, like you're, you're, you're watching this and then you're thinking like, Oh wait, am I going to be a fan of a team that's actually really, really good now? You know what I mean? Like you're like it's like you're 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 trying to uh, to battle the there's the, there's the there's the fan side of you that always has rose colored glasses on. That's I'm always trying to battle the guy that's like, hey, no, we're unbelievable. You know what I mean? Like right. that that bot, the, the 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 Homer in me. And so in those moments, especially, it gets almost impossible to tell how realistic you're being. Because, yeah, just the, the 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 party is on, and somehow you've got Kobe down twenty, and the place right. is going ballistic, and you know Russ is making everything, and you know Durant's flying down the court in transition and hitting these above the break threes that look like layups to him. Yeah, it was it was just uh, a lot of like a lot of wonder, right? Like you're just like I can't believe how good they look. And then you start to be like, huh, I wonder what this could look like in the future. That's a, te- that's a terribly long answer. I apologize. It first off, this is not like uh, we're not chopping every one of these for TikTok. Like it's totally okay. Um, <laughs> uh, but then, but the other part like that, but that's exactly, it's why I wanted to go back and kind of trace where we came from, because I think that, you know, the, that's the, the points that you made there. Like, I thought we were further away and like, I wonder where this can go from here you are back there. Like we are back at that place with Oklahoma city thunder basketball. And, you know, there, there's other, you know, other, there was an, the interregnum there of like, Oh, Ibaka becomes Oladipo and Demonis Sabonis and they become Paul friggin' George and (laughs) like Carmelo comes to town. They keep making the playoffs even after everything kind of shifts and, 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 uh, it becomes more malleable there and the Katie and the rest of it all and all those sorts of things. But like the, you, you know, the, remaining competitive for several years and then briefly like a two year dip into tankdom brings you now back to this place where as we enter, you know, we're, t- we're talking on Tuesday afternoon here on the East coast and like they are 27 and 12. They're a game back of the wolves tied f- with the nuggets for second place in the West. Um, you know, coming off a loss to the Lakers and you got a date with the Clippers coming up. It's a pretty tough back to back, but like this is a team that can handle that kind of business. Um, They've outscored opponents by 9.1 points per 100 possessions, according to Cleaning the Glass. Best net rating in the West, second only to the Celtics. Top five on both sides of the ball. Like, this is, you are back in that kind of uh, set of circumstances. And I think the big piece of that, as we sort of transition a little bit to this year's team, is Shea Gilgis Alexander, you know, and, uh, you know, we mentioned that like the Paul George, the, all of these pieces and, you know, one red paper clip becomes a house, uh, you know, Ser- <laughs> Serge Ibaka down the line becomes Shea Gilgis Alexander. And he is now like top three, top four MVP candidate, uh, around 31, six and six a game That's shooting crazy. 56% from the floor. Yeah. Everything I say makes me want to laugh more. And I'm wondering, <laughs> what is your, and I know you you had written a, a wonderful piece about him making the leap at the ringer a little while back. And then it seems like he's just sort of kept making leaps, like how Mario yeah. can keep jumping in the air. Um, <sighs> what is your favorite thing about watching Shea Gilgis Alexander? What a good question. Um, man, that's hard. I, I think the, it's the off balance stuff or the stuff that looks like it should be off balance, but somehow he's not you know what I mean more more like the 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 like below the rim acrobatics the on the ground acrobatics that 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 he's able to wiggle and manipulate not just through the whole defense but also like in these tight isolation situations when there's been more and more times recently where it looks like a defender's kind of got him dead to rights 
uh, like where he's maybe picked up his dribble in the post or something like that. And just through lift fakes and pivots and shimmies, he finds daylight and he's strong enough. Now he can finish through contact. So it's kind of made him all the more exciting down there around the rim because the pot, I mean, he had like six and ones the other night against the magic is something crazy. ridiculous. Like he, I mean, he hit, he hit, he, he, he got Jalen Suggs in the air on one in the mid post after a couple lifts. And you could tell Suggs was just furious with himself for falling for the lift, but it was one of those, like, it, you know, you, you feel so bad for Suggs. You like, he can't, he can't, it's, it, you, you see more and more like, he's getting like the top flight defender every night. And these guys are putting together good possessions. They're doing everything they can strong contests, right? Like even, even when they're not letting him get a straight line drive on him and they're keeping him in front of him and getting him to a step back and getting, you know, a hand up. It's just, I mean, he's up to 35% on his threes. Now that's been, that's been a bit of an upswing, but he also kind of doesn't need to take them. Yeah, and it's that's like that he that he can get thirty so easily, really with the the three as like an after afterthought is just like wild. I mean, his I I guess that I guess that would be my answer. Like the 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 off balance <laughs> on balance kind of acrobatics are the reason that I because I, because he's one of those guys that you think you can watch and kind of see a finish that maybe you haven't seen before. And those are, those are the types of players that I love to see because they just crack your brain open and, and, and make you realize like that other things are possible. You know what I mean? Well, it it feels like he's dancing to a song that you've never heard a beat like that before. Right. And you're like, like, oh, like, who are these guys? They're the Neptunes. And you're like, oh, what the like, like, what the (laughs) hell is that? I want to listen to all their stuff. Can I listen to all of it? Yeah. Right. That sounds like it's from outer space. Um, (laughs) And and like the the. Well, just we don't I don't often go to the to the numbers hardcore here because it's more about feelings than numbers. But you mentioned the isolation. He's shooting 57 percent on two pointers when he isos somebody. Um, he, if is, he he's like he's what, like what Chris Paul has been in the mid range all these years. Like he's kind of turned into that. Just it's nails. Yeah. I mean, if he's getting down, if he gets down there and lets it go, you feel really, really good about it. And it doesn't really matter the situation. I mean, just like all of this, all of his in between work, like his stuff from like eleven to sixteen feet, like all that whole area is just nasty, nasty at this point. Like it's, it's, he, he really, you feel like he's got full command of whatever he wants to do, especially now that the Thunder are a good shooting team for the first time in what feels like ever, right? Like right. forever, yeah. like it, 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 that, that they're actually able to put all this shooting around him and give him this space and give him this room to operate. It's just like, that, that's, that's part of, part of the thing was like, like you talk about how he, like, I wrote that thing that said he was making the leap, but he keeps doing it. Like. It feels like really from jump straight, like from from when he first got to Kentucky, it's just been constantly people kind of underrating what he can be. And then he makes a leap and people kind of readjust and they say, OK, he's going to be this now. And then he makes another leap and then people readjust. And then it's it, 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 he, he's become a player who it makes me feel like I'm doing him a disservice if I like put any ceiling on, you know, like what he's going to be like, you know what I mean? Like for all I know in two years, he's going to be shooting 40% from three on like high volume or whatever, you know, like, I, I don't know. I, you know, it, it, uh, he just keeps getting better that the, that he's, that the defense has gone up a level in the way that it has this year. And that, cause I think it would have been easy for him to kind of let his foot off the gas on that end of the floor, especially with the addition of Chet. Um, Jalen Williams taking a step forward and being able to guard people like it wouldn't have surprised me to see him be like, OK, I can conserve some energy down here. They can hide me on some guys and I can just kind of take some possessions off. And he doesn't do that, that he's that he's taken a leap there and. Is using his energy on that end, too, um, and can actually like affect some change down there is it has has really like sort of also changed th- where he could end up in my head. Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. You point to the, like, 
you don't want to put an artificial ceiling on it because every time you do it or you you put a governor on it, it's like, no, he blasts right through that. Even me saying like he is at worst a top three or four MVP candidate. I'm like, is that too, you know, like you know, now, you know, like here be monsters out, out in the world. So you got to be careful, like saying, you know, uh, that that would put him any higher. He goes above Jokic and Embiid and Giannis, but also like, I don't, you know, talk to me in a month. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but you, you mentioned also uh, the, that he actually, he, he is operating in space unlike he has gotten before and all like, unlike any Thunder team has had before. I want to talk to you a minute about Chet Holmgren. Yeah. Um, because I, I've talked about this on this show before and written about it. We've, we've sort of batted it around a bunch. The idea that last year's Thunder was sort of like a team that had a big hole in the middle of it. Like you knew exactly what the piece was that needed to go there. And it was like, well, they're the things that are not great about it. We know what goes in there to fix it. Right. And then Chet Holmgren plays this year after missing all last season with the foot injury. And the degree to which he lit, he absolutely fixed, <laughs> fixed all of those things <laughs> and filled that hole so perfectly is, is almost ludicrous. And, uh, I, so a, a piece that's going to be out today, maybe may already up by the time this goes out, um, I wrote about like potential first time all-stars. Yeah. I think there's a real chance he makes the all-star team this year. And I, I guess I'm wondering what, you know, what it's been like to watch him, you know, hit the ground, not even, I don't know, sprinting, you know, to, to go midstream and to be the piece that like, exactly what they've sort of were looking for. What is it like watching him sort of hit the ground running like that? Oh, I mean, I like he's he's exceeded every expectation. I think he, for what he for what he could could be this year, especially and 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 that the um, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of like wa watching the games last year and thinking theoretically this guy is the perfect puzzle piece and 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 fits seamlessly and just we hit the ground running. And it's so weird that that's exactly what happened. Yeah, we're so wrong, so rarely right about this sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, well, and it's also like it feels it, it felt like the type of thing where it's like it, it. Yes, he is that, but in three or four years, you know what I mean? Yes, like, right. like, like, like. Yes, he fixed these. He fixes these things long term, but he's not going to be so good at fixing them right off the bat that it looks really good from jump that that he's been so effective already on both ends of the floor like he's gonna get he's gonna get bodied he's gonna get muscled guys are gonna catch him at the rim for sure he's gonna catch his fair share of guys too and like that's going to happen because he's a lunatic and he jumps for everything yeah and he's he's just this hard playing dude who's got a lot of length and is unafraid of getting put on a poster, and it just causes a lot of fireworks. I mean, Anthony Davis caught him last night in a big way uh, against the Lakers, and but then he'll go up and you know what he, the, against I, I, the the one that, that's coming in my head right now is was against uh, y'all against the Knicks the other night. <laughs> right. he, uh, Hartenstein tried to catch him. I mean, Randall got him at the very very end of the game whenever the whenever it was like one of the last possessions and the Thunder were up eleven or something like that. But the he he went up and got Hartenstein with two hands at the rim, and he's done that to to a lot of guys. That it the the combination of oh the three point shot is just kind of real right away. That he's that and can protect the rim and can also attack off the bounce in a way that doesn't mess with the flow of the offense right. that he can, that he can join in on the driving and the cutting. I mean, he's actually a pretty good cutter. He just, he, he just knows how to play basketball. He knows where to be. I think you see sometimes these teams try to turn these centers that can shoot into like a guy that can kind of play five out and have the ball in his hand and make decisions and make, and, 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 and cut and, and hit guys on the move. And it's like, well, no, they can't do all those other things. They can shoot. And, Chet's got a lot of different tools. You know what I mean? There's, there's, he's the stuff that he does well is the stuff that the Thunder offense rewards, if that makes sense. Like the way, the way that, that the way that Dagnalt has built out that system of just 
constant drives and cuts and kicks and find space. Okay. Like, you know, we've got a, we've got a side of the floor cleared for y'all. Y'all do a little two man game here. Like all that stuff, inverted pick and rolls, guard screening for the bigs, whatever. Like he's, he is comfortable in a lot of different spaces on the floor doing a lot of different actions. Right. And so it's that he's, that he has been able to be a plus in so many different categories and you can't really pick on him in any one way has been the biggest surprise. I didn't think the the off the bounce stuff was going to be like this at all at at this point, you know, like you, you would, you could see the, the whispers of it and stuff, but even in some of the summer league among plenty of, you know, happy, positive flashes. Sometimes he'd get a little wide with the handle. Guards could kind of get inside of it and poke it out and stuff. You felt like, okay, like it's going to take him a minute to adjust to the speed and figure out like how low he's got to be. You know what I mean? And he's, it just seems like he's figured that out. I think it's helped playing in all that space has helped him too. Some of those like you know, drives rights that these like kind of wide spins back to the middle. You know yeah. what I mean? Like maybe those lead to more turnovers if he's not playing with a team that's shooting as well as the Thunder are right now. But it's yeah, he's that he's been so effective on both ends has been it's just more than any Thunder fan, I think, could have could have asked for, honestly. Well, yeah, you know, you mentioned all of the things he can already do so well. And, you know, the Oklahoma City is familiar with watching a seven foot string being who can handle and pull up (laughs) and do a lot of things like no one is you know what here i am about to put artificial governors on stuff it would be an awful lot to ask you know diane knew if if if, uh if he become he got to kevin durant i'm not saying that no a thousand percent (laughs) but to see that level of skill and versatility and the options that it opens up for you on both ends of the floor but especially where you know all of a sudden you can have somebody that walks into 18 a night without necessarily needing to have a whole lot run for him. It does allow you to kind of wish cast and start dreaming big a little bit and, and wonder, you know, if, if, if the version of Chet we are seeing today is the one that we thought maybe we would see in a few years, then what is the version of Chet we see in a few years? The Thunder themselves, but Chet in particular, you see him take so many, he gets so many wide open threes mm-hmm. because of how worried defenses are about Shea and now Jalen Williams is really starting to turn a corner here lately as as like a guy who can be a primary too he's getting to play in so much space now that he's able to be as smart of a player as he is you know what I mean like he's not you're you're not you, you never watch Chet and feel like he's really all that rushed and I think part of that is just he's you know a a good player and those guys tend to play at their own pace, but it's also because of how solidified everything is around him. He's getting to pick on some defenses in rotation and things like that. You know what I mean? And that, and that's, that doesn't feel like a thing that's going to go away. All this stuff feels so duplicable. You don't watch it and think he's like playing over his head or, or that things are just sort of, set up in such a way offensively where like, okay, it's, it's just working out that the shots are going to him right now. You know what I mean? Like he's, he's able to do so much. It just, it, it feels like that even as developed as he already is, it does still feel very early and like you're just scratching the surface of what it can be just because, I mean, you're, you're seeing them, start to figure out different counters for things even already. Like you're seeing more like the, 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 the lob chemistry between Jalen and Williams and Chet has gotten exponentially better, even in the course of the last like two weeks, you know what I mean? Like it just, they, they, they're, they're still learning each other and figuring out like how Chet's skill set fits around theirs. You know what I mean? Cause it's still, it's, you know, we're not even, what are, are we even 40 games into the season at this point? Barely. And so it's like it, 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 I keep trying to remind myself, especially with Chet, that it's still so, 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 so early. Right. And it's, and, and even, even though I'm totally with you, like I think, it, I think an all star nod is, 
entirely plausible and and not at all um, insane to to discuss it it but it is one of those things where I do have to keep like getting it in my head hey this is like the very very beginning of this and it you know it it uh it both makes me get very all the more excited and also just sort of like okay like let's just relax and try to enjoy this you know what i mean it's a it's a it's a fun place to be in as a fan right now right yeah that's we we've talked about it a few times on the show that idea that uh from my friend paul flannery used to say like the best time you can have in this league is right before you get really good but now we're also like you are really good and still <laughs> have it, <laughs> no. which is like maybe even the best time. Uh, I don't know. Um, but to that point, you know, you say like it's still so early. And I know that's the the, the thing that Presty said uh, before the preseason press conference. Like we haven't even, you know, we, let us finish our breakfast before we figure out kind of where <laughs> we go next, um, which I like. I hope that he got that from Jay. Like, I hope that's where he, he took that from. My homie Strick <laughs> told me to finish your breakfast. But um, I mean, it, it, as a as a guy who has quoted tribe in many a uh, <laughs> in, 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 in big press conferences and big television <laughs> specials, it's totally plausible. And maybe maybe it was you should ask him that maybe you'd actually get a response from uh, from them if you. Uh, yeah, yeah. You know, who, you know who everybody's looking to field uh, press requests from is uh, is me about this. Uh, but in any event, quick, quick Jay Z question for Sam. Yeah, right. I, you know, I, if, if, if I'm on deadline, so if he can get back to me like right now, that'd be incredible. Thank you so much. Um, but you know, to, to I, we're saying all these one, these incredible things about the the individual talent they've got. I'm really glad you brought up Jalen Williams because he was somebody that if I if I had a little more time and a little more space and a little more opportunity, I probably would have put him in. It's like you could argue for a uh, you know he's a, a, a at least someone to think about on your long list as a, a first time All Star with the way he's been playing. Um, but in addition to just being a top five team on both sides of the ball, being you know vying for first place, all those sorts of things. This is, uh, I checked the number with basketball reference, by average age on the roster, this is the youngest team in the NBA, average age 23.1 years old, yeah. um, right in that Kobe White breakout sweet spot. Um, <laughs> and they have, I, I counted it earlier, if I have, uh, might have counted wrong, but I believe as many as 15, control over as many as 15 first round picks between now and 2030, even more second round picks than that, uh, liter literally more assets than a team could use. So, sure. you know, what do you get for the man who has everything? You know, what would you even want to add to this team at this stage? I mean, yeah, that's, that's it. That seems to be the big the big question right now. I it, it um I think they need more. I I wouldn't want to bring in unless it was just the, the uh, there are obviously exceptions to uh, to everything I'm about to say, but I I would hesitate to bring in anybody who messed too much with the shot distribution hierarchy mm. they're all they're already trying to like figure out how to make sure that Shay, Jalen Williams and Chet are the three guys taking the most shots right that's already something that is like every now and again Giddy's shooting way too much same thing with I mean Dort, Dort's been great this year I mean and, I mean Giddy's been playing better lately um, Dort's been shooting it well this year, but there's, there's still times where it's like, you know, you look, you look at certain games and you see, you see that, you know, Giddy has taken 12 shots and Chet's taken eight. And it's like, yeah. that can't happen. Uh, yeah. That doesn't, that's that the, the days of that being all right are like at the beginning of the year. That wasn't okay. You know what I mean? Like, it's just like, let's figure out a way to get our best guys the ball and to, and to, to, to get our best guy shots. And so I, I, I hesitate to want to bring in somebody who is going to need 12 to 15 shots a game. If only because it's still so early with Chet and, and Jalen's development that I don't want to, if it's somebody who's going to have the ball in their hands a lot, I don't necessarily and again, exceptions galore, but I don't necessarily want to bring in somebody who's going to take the ball out of Jalen's hands right now. He's 
started to show a lot of healthy sauce in these in these I late love that games. Phrase. I love that phrase. Like it's 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 it is it it is confidence and execution, like with a dash of how dare you think you could garden. You know what I mean? Like it's like there's 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 that there's a good combination there that I just I think he's just going to keep blooming with the more opportunities that they give him and the and as the as he takes more of the reins of that second unit, especially when Shea's off the floor, as it kind of becomes clear, like all right, Giddy doesn't need to have we let's 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 move even more of his touches over here to Jalen. Let's get him and Chet in these pick and rolls and let them play in space and just let him be. I mean, J- Jalen's another guy who in the mid range has just become ice cold. Yeah, I mean, monster. it's, 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 I mean, everybody was talking after the, after that great Celtics win, the Thunder had, everybody was talking about that final play he had where Shea goes and screens for him. And then he just takes Tatum off the bounce and gives Tatum a shoulder and Tatum can't do anything with the physicality, which is insane to say that somebody like Tatum <laughs> can't handle that in that moment. But it it was it was no problem for Dub, and there's been a couple of times lately where they've just given him the ball and said, "Okay, you go shut the door." Like it's it, 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 and 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 they feel they feel good about that, and so I I I get worried about bringing in somebody who might be trying to eat off his plate a little bit, if that makes sense. That said, they need another wing. Some somebody bigger that can guard some people and can help on the boards, and then I they, they I would love if they went and got a big. The, my, my biggest thing with the with the other big is, you know, you hear people throw out like somebody like Claxton or something like that, who I think is a great player and uh, like a quality big, depending on how the team wants to play. Mm-hmm. The way the Thunder play and the way that offense is at its best is when the ball is moving and when everybody out there is a threat to do something with it. And if you bring in a guy who is just going to kind of be a big and not be able to take people off the bounce, not be able to shoot, not be a threat with the ball, then I think that it negates a lot of what the Thunder do well. And I don't want to bring in somebody to lean on Jokic for 15 minutes if right. they're not going to be able, if we're not going to be able to get anything done offensively during that time, you know what I mean? And so it's, it, uh, I, somebody like a Kelly Olenek or something like that, who can actually play with the ball in his hands and make some decisions and will be fine. Like no matter how many minutes they get, you know what I mean? That seems kind of idyllic, you know, if the, if the wolves are tired and Nas Reed would love to take him off their hands. Um, but, I, think, uh, I think, I think you got a better chance at Kelly. I think you got a better chance at Kelly than that one. Feels, it feels like it. Um, but uh, no, so, players in that kind of archetype, you know, I would, I would rather see, see guys like that than, than somebody who's, you know, going to want to go into the post and get, you know, five touches or whatever during, during their stint. Like I, it, it, I, I, I'd more rather see some free flowing basketball. I mean, you're seeing plenty of free flowing basketball with the Oklahoma city thunder these days. It's an absolute joy to watch them. Uh, let's figure out a way that we can get Kelly Olenek. And I don't know, Dorian Finney Smith or something. Let's get those guys over there. That's uh, a hot name. Yeah. Right. Like, you know, a, bo- a bodyguard who doesn't really, who's not going to talk too much. You know, yeah. Let's get that guy <laughs> over in the corner. That'd be tremendous for all of us. Um, before so yeah wherever we go from here i'm very excited to see where we go with the thunder but where we go from here on the show is we're going to wrap up with something called the closing five tyler parker because as i'm sure you know you are a certified ball knower how you start is not nearly as important as how you finish five (laughs) questions for our special guest question the first as i mentioned earlier you wrote a novel titled a little blood and dancing published last summer i've never written anything longer than a few thousand words so that prospect absolutely terrifies me what is the overriding emotion of putting something that big out in the world? Oh, uh, the overriding emotion. If I'm being honest, abject terror. But <laughs> but the but the um like in in there too. Uh, you know, the, the at forty nine percent is um is uh, just like 
elation, right? Like just, just, uh, um, there's, there's relief in there. There's dumbfoundedness, you know, there's all sorts of different, th- <laughs> different things mixed in, but yeah, it, it uh, y- y- totally terrified because it's, it's, it's the one thing. Well, not the one thing, but it's, it's a thing that when you, w- when you put it out, if people don't like it, it, there, there's nowhere else for the blame to go. You know what I mean? Man. And so it's, you do, you do in, in ways even different than just like writing a piece, you know, that goes up online. Like, you know, if there's some like kind of weird headline that gets people confused or something and then get some, you can like kind of say like, oh, well that maybe that was, you can <laughs> throw a little of the blame that way. This one is like if if uh, you if someone uh, you know tags you on Twitter and is like, "Hey, pal, swing and a miss," then it's uh, you know <laughs> like, it, uh, it's it, it's you you've got nowhere for that loss to go other than just right around your neck. You know what I mean? And so it it that all of that yeah mixed in with just like oh it's I I, I wrote that thing for seven years and was was um you know so you, you you're so worried it won't get bought it won't come out it, it won't right. come out right like that, that that all this all this has been uh for not and so that that it that it did come out uh yeah i'm just i'm tickled man i it uh it it it, it uh it's the book that i wanted to write you know what i mean and so it it, it didn't get it didn't get like bastardized in the editing editing process. It didn't, I didn't have to like change shit about it that I liked. You know what I mean? Like it was, it, it was, it was what I wanted to write. And so I'm, I'm over the moon, you know, it, it's ultimately. Yeah. I love both parts of that because the first thing you said where it's like, if it's, if someone doesn't like it, then there's no place for it to go, but around your neck. Maybe I can identify with that as somebody who had to start a show with his name in the title that is just his face and his name and his voice and a whole bunch of things that where people are like, yes. hey, what would you do? What what makes this the most like the inside of your head? And I'm like, well, what if people hate that? Um, uh, it's a bummer. But then the second part of that is great because like when someone says a nice thing about it, you're like, that person must get me. Like if they like totally. this, then they must get what the whole thing is. Totally. And, the, and that's a great point. And the, 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 the compliments that you do, you do feel them more for something that you've, that is entirely you and that you've spent a lot of time on. Like, like I know how hard you work and how much you pay attention to the details and stuff. And so I'm sure that whenever someone compliments a specific aspect of, of the way that you're doing divine intervention, it like, you take it and it feels even better because you're seeing someone see and appreciate the way that you see things and the way, you know what I mean? Like the things that you notice. Yeah. And there's, there's a, that's a, that's a, it's a very good feeling whenever something that you have really fussed over and thought was worth fussing over when it is, um, appreciated and complimented. Like it, there is, there is, on a, on like a primal level, it's like, oh, that work was, was good, was, was for something. Okay, good. But it's just also like, yeah, it's like validation, right? It's like, okay, this, this, this worked. Let's try to go, keep going more towards this, right? Like, how can we be more of this? You know what I mean? Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm all over the place with this no, answer. I feel that's like com- that- that's completely okay because it made me think of two things, and we'll get from this into question the second. But that uh, you, it makes me think of I forget which football player it was, but it said like you pay me for practicing the Sunday I do for free. Like every sure, other sure, day sure. is the so like when you say like whatever work goes into it and the structuring and the note cards on the wall and how we reorganize all of it, like that's what you're. And then, but then like when the actual stuff goes on the page. And it comes out that way and you're like, well, that's the way it is in my head. That's what, uh, yeah, yeah, that's that, that, that I do for free. Oh, well, not for free pay, pay people. Feel, fr- feel free to cut this because I know I'm not the one that's supposed to be asking the questions, but I'm, <laughs> but I'm what, like when you, when you, when you started your, like this pod and you were like, okay, I'm going to have my own podcast and you decide and it, and it goes out like, what was the feeling in your body whenever all that is happening because i know for me i mean even like in, in this in this in this 
I think you, you you comparing it to the book is perfect, and and because it is like, oh, this is my thing. This you know, like it's like it it, it it what was what was going through your head whenever you're you've done all this work and you've you've got this format that you're happy with and it goes out like before, but. It, I, I have a follow up too, but I, but just when it <laughs> but when it when it goes when it goes out, what like what is? Because even me now, if like a piece of mine goes up, I'm like nervous. Sure, you yeah, know what no. I mean. Like a, like a little bit, like depending on what it's about or whatever. Like you're a little bit like, man, I hope this is received. You don't like, yeah, you do want it to be received well, as gross and like like uh, desperate as that sounds. Like I I I can never get away from that. Like oh man, I hope people like this one. You know yeah, I mean? No, a thousand like, percent. And I feel like uh, so he's muted, so I can't hear him right now. But I have to imagine that super producer John Gennaro is eyes like laughing his ass off at this <laughs> question because nobody has been more uh, more subject to my uh, self-doubt and my uncertainty about all this and my like <laughs> yeah. self-consciousness about all of it. Um, I when I got when I left the ringer and I came back to Yahoo Sports and it was like, well, we're doing we're going to get sort of a podcast network up and running. The first thing I said was, I don't need to have my own thing. I'll be, as long as I'm part of the conversation, I'm happy with it. I do not need to have my own thing. And then as the conversations kind of went on, I was like, well, what if you did have your own thing? I have been dragged to this place kicking and screaming because of my sure. own anxiety over it, right? Like the sure. idea that if they really get to know you, they will run. And <laughs> so like, what is, because when, you know, it's like, what, how do we make this show like the way you think about things? And I'm like, no one could ever possibly give a shit about the way I think about things. It's like, actually there might, maybe they would if, right, you, right, if right. you actually presented it that way. And so I have been trying to act as if I'm the person uh, that these people have it, uh, allegedly maybe want to hear from and make the show that like, I'm going to be the, try to be the confident person that they think they want to hear. And, you know, we're three <laughs> or four months into it and we'll see, I don't know, but every, oh, every I mean, I think you're, it's gangbusters. I like, I'm, I'm, I'm asking you this from a place of, I know the show is going really well and that like, you're well, super your likable for that. Well, I mean, you're, I just know that you're super likable and know what the hell you're talking about and are, <laughs> and are, are fun to listen to. Like that's, that's all I need to know. No, you know what I mean? But like, well, now, now I'm glad we're cutting all this out. That's great. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I, it, but I, it, when it did go out and then people started to respond with like, hell yes, this is great. Doesn't that like really get you going? Like, is it, doesn't that feel just so good? It's, it is. And I, I mean, again, this is, you know, maybe too much in my own brain, but like, it is relentlessly surprising when that happens i'm like are you sure <laughs> um right. and you have to just sort of like you know the, the extend to yourself the kindness you would extend to all those other people that you would compliment their work and you would say like yeah i've enjoyed uh the things that you write the things that you say the things that you make um allow for the possibility that that could also be true the other way around right that it could be a two, totally. two way traffic and so yes but yeah it, it feels incredible which is why you know you do all the other stuff to prep for it and get ready for it so um but now we're not going to waste the rest of that prep Question the second. <laughs> you have tweeted on multiple occasions about the Live Moss lifestyle. Yes. You identified uh, Cam Thomas as embodying the Live Moss lifestyle, and you recently identified a number of other players who do as well, including the aforementioned Kobe White and Simone yes. Fontecchio. A three word question about the Live Moss lifestyle Why not Russ? You know, I've thought about this. This is, I, I, I thought about Russ, including Russ on on that in the addendum. And I think at different points, he does reach the live Moss lifestyle. I think that he is sometimes at this point in his career, there is still a little bit too much helter skelterness out there. And in order to live Moss, you it's fine if I don't know what's about to happen, but I don't want to be too scared about the possibilities. You know what I mean? Like I want, I, I, I like surprise, but I don't want a surprise that could turn into like a real deal, like the buildings are collapsing disaster. Right. And I, I, I love Russ, as you know, 
but I do, but it, it, it there's maybe just a little bit too much rage in there at different points for me to fully get him into the live the the, the live moss lifestyle family. An addendum sub question to this because why not? Let's make this this segment as long <laughs> as humanly possible. <laughs> um, it was something I meant to bring up earlier, but I didn't get to it. Katie leaves and goes to the Warriors, and yeah. obviously that had its own level of anxiety and sturm and drang and everything with that. It does allow for unfettered Russell Westbrook, which gives you the triple doubles and the MVP and everything like that. If you had to pick one or the other, one, Katie sticks around, but you never get maximalist Russ Two, right. it unfolds the way it has. You know, is it a, you know, devil, you know, devil, you don't like wh where, where does your fandom uh, meter lead you on that? Boy, what a heater from you here. This is good. This is, I, I think, boy, the re unfettered Russ was just, it was one of those things where like, early on, you're like, man, could this work? And then very quickly, you're in the very, very back of your mind. You're like, I don't think this can work, but I'm not going to admit it yet. This is too, <laughs> this is too, this is, there's, this is making me feel too much. I don't want to try to put any sort of reality into this. <laughs> I just want to live in the clouds for a second. Um, but I think I would stick with Durant staying, if only because I think it would have probably led to a title, probably. Right. Um, and that and that's what we're here for. Um, no. That being said, sorry, sorry. Is that what we're not? What, we're not. It's what the it's what the organization is here for. It's what all the executives are here for. And right. yes, to some degree, I mean, fan. Like, I I will not. I will never undercut fans' search for joy. Being like a championship is the pinnacle and the apotheosis of all that. Right. But what we are here for is the feelings you just talked about. That's true. That's a good point. I think, like, I in my head, a a title would have given me more feeling, more good feelings. Sure. I think than the than pure unfiltered Russ. I will say that there were times during that MVP season, and then even in the following one where when he would go on a run, you would sort of feel like, well, I'm not sure if I can like, if this can like be any more fun. You yes, know what I mean? Like right. when he was, cause there was a force of nature element with prime Russ where he could like, it just felt like he could like bend the whole court to the point that it would just snap. You know what I mean? And like, everyone is just like tumbling to, into like, fiery earth and for some reason he's not you know right. and like it th there it, it was uh, it was there was a level of like spectacle with him that is, is hard for one dude to be able to achieve and and he and he would do it semi-regularly and sometimes for bad reasons but <laughs> but it was yes. but there was always some uh, there was always some part of you with him where you were like, and, and I, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe he's why I gravitate to players like this, or I don't know what's the chicken and what's the egg. Right. Sure. But it's like it, it I like, I like guys who, when I'm watching them, I think in the back of my head, there's a possibility that they'll do something that I haven't seen and, and will show me something new and, in a in a game that even as much as it's evolved and as as it 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 it, it gets the NBA gets like more and more different by the day, right? Like yep. it's it, there, it certainly some of the uh, offense is a little bit more homogenized than maybe the, the the I'd like a little bit more of a grab bag, but like whatever it it's still changing by the day, and 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 so it that there are these guys that can get to a place where you're seeing them actually break some ground still, even, you know, in a league that's like filled with guys that were better than him. If like going back to the Russ experience, like, like LeBron was better. Durant was better. Harden was better. Uh, these uh, pl plenty of uh, other dudes were, better team basketball players than him for sure. And even just individual basketball players than him. But there, 
there was something about him where you were like, yeah, but Russ might make me see God tonight. Exactly like, right. Like, exactly like, right. I I hear what you're saying. Kawhi is wildly efficient. And yes, around 17 feet, if he can get to a spot, like, yes, it's curtains. But I don't think Kawhi is going to, like, make me trip. And <laughs> and Russ is, there's always that threat with him where it's like, I might see a color I've never seen before. Right. And so it, it that holding that holding out <laughs> uh hope for guys like that well I, i'll always do that if only because it's like kobe, like kobe white going back to him like when you see some of this some of the like dribble combos that he tries in these tight spaces if if he keep if he keeps getting this green green light he might do one of these like step against the clippers like weird figure eight two <laughs> two between the legs crossovers into a back-to-back -back between two guys into a four, like a 25 footer like that might be in his future and so that those sorts of dudes are always going to get my blood pumping a little bit more than other guys all that said supposedly if Durant came Al Horford was going to come and if we had had Horford <laughs> if we had had Horford Durant and Russ yeah then I feel pretty good you know what I mean but as you know you, we're also going to have to go through the Warriors again that next year and and you know, who knows where, how the Cavs are looking at that point, you know, who like it, uh, yeah, the counterfactual is difficult to then reproduce. I understand there's, 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 there's no, there's no, there's no guarantees either direction with the stuff, but I, but I, 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 I would have loved to have seen what they would, because part, part of the thing with those late period Thunder teams was they were, there was, there were like, a lot of injuries, obviously, like yeah. at crucial points in some of those in, in, in some of those postseason runs and things. But there were also just injuries like during the seasons. And so there there wasn't like a you know, Ibaka would be dinged up every now and again, right? And you know, Durant, Durant and Russ might take turns being out for some games. Like there was you wanted to see them have another season where everybody's healthy and they can sort of some of that continuity can start to pay off. Like they had continuity, but maybe not like where they needed it. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. it, it was like, but the, you know, the, the, that that's also wildly wishful thinking on my part. So, yeah. Well, we get to we get to engage in wishful thinking here, uh, yes. as evidenced by this, the the discussions of the Live Moss lifestyle and Kobe White's <laughs> dribble package. Uh, question the third: Before you became a real professional basketball writer, you studied and performed improv comedy in Chicago, legendary improv Olympic and Second City theaters. Who are some NBA players you think might make good scene partners? Oh my God, Dan! You're really coming with just gas today this is, great. <laughs> You're, uh, this is fantastic the good scene partners well what makes a good scene partner um happy to let their shit go in like always has ideas and is is either is coming with something good but is also happy to let so, let their shit go in the name of a better direction you know what mm -hmm. i mean for the scene i think and um, I would say, you know who would probably be unbelievable at improv are the Lopez brothers. They would mm. probably be, they would probably be like, it, they would probably be frustratingly good, I think, <laughs> at it. For like, like people that had been doing it for a long time, they'd like watch them and be like, well, why are they good already? What is that? <laughs> you know, like, and the yeah, the Lopez brothers would be good. I think that Anthony Edwards would probably be unbelievable at it. I think I think that Jordan Poole would either be the best improviser that you've ever seen, or would tank shows at, at the drop of a hat. Like I think it could, he he either comes on with the best bit you've ever heard. Or people get up and leave after he initiates. I mean, you know this, I mean, it seems to be a replication of the experience we've had thus far in his <laughs> career, where it's like you're either Steph Jr. or you are maybe the least watchable player in the entire NBA. 
Um, but maybe, maybe maybe that's it winds up being a certain level of watchability to that as well. You know, like I cannot believe it's unfolding this way. Yeah. Well, you're you you did you do ever do improv? No, never did. Okay, but I know that you know that world a little. Like you know, I know you're like no comedy. I've had some, yeah, I know a couple of the people through this stuff, like through basketball stuff, like Josh gotcha. Gondelman was kind enough to be a guest on the show, yeah. you know, the um, Ian Carmel and the all fantasy everything guys. But yeah, that's not something Great I've dudes. ever done. Great dudes. Love them both. The are, did, did who's, what, who's your answer? Do you have an answer for that question? No, I love the Lopez brothers because what I was thinking of, especially when you said like, somebody who's will, who will bring ideas, but is willing to get out of the way to make it all work. I'm like, it's somebody who is willing to box out and like, make, <laughs> make sure we like, I, and I wonder, you know, Steven Adams, I wonder if he's a little too taciturn and sort of dry for it or like a little yeah. bit too, um, you know, but I love, I love that idea. Sorry. <laughs> Super producer, John Gennaro just pops into the chat to scream Josh Hart, which is picking up on a bit from before from the pre-roll, but, uh, also very well could be. And, and somebody he who probably would be, he probably, probably would be good. Yeah, he, and, and you know the 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 natural dynamic that he and Jalen Brunson have as a comedy duo and the the post game pressers, I could see that working out really and well. And now, as I, I that that just obviously just makes me start thinking about the Knicks, and then I think of OG, and then I think of what about Scarves, his moment with Serge, with from, Serge. Se from a few years ago, and that I do think is one of the funniest interactions that I've ever seen, like committed to tape <laughs> between two NBA players. I really think it's like there are points in that, like when. Serge is saying, oh, gee, you say you told me about you say you told me about fashion. I think there are parts in that minute and a half long interaction that are just as good as any big budget comedy that we've seen in the last 25 <laughs> years. Um, <laughs> so I do think that OG would probably be sneaky. Very good at it. I love that answer. Question the fourth. How good is Trey Young and how does how much does being from Oklahoma influence your answer to this question? Good. Yes. The so I I think that Trey is I think that like Trey's truth lies probably somewhere in between like there there is like a probably a certain type of casual basketball fan who knows him just through ads and highlights and oh he's a little guy who's had some success and like look at these these big, big shots that he takes and makes and these cool passes and thinks he's probably better than he is. But then I think that the, some hardcore NBA fans, I think probably get a little bit, maybe too hung up on the defense. Like I agree that it's, a, it's not good and that it, it needs to be better if he ever wants to be on some title team. But I also think that it's a, it's a thing that keeps people from being able to put as much respect on his game as it deserves, if that makes sense. Like, the, I, I think that if he was just a chucker and didn't involve other dudes at all, and I, and I get that these are like oftentimes like he's, he's the only one that's touched it. And then the assist is right before, a, a, yes. you know, I like it's, it's, I get that he's not letting everybody share the ball, but I also think that his, just as a pure passer, there are, are there, he's top five. I don't, I, and I don't, I'm, I'm not ready for to, to go with the, to, to do any rankings of any kind, but like, the stuff that he can do. I'm sure like, they'll have you rank these at the ringer at some point. Yeah, Ranking's right, kind of a big part of the operation. They, it seemed to, it's, it seems to be. <laughs> Which, I, hey, I was part of, I was part of plenty of them. That's not a shot at the no. company. I was, I was there right now. I was in the mines too, man. No, I get it. And it's also like, it just, I, there, there's a lot of places have a lot of rankings. It yes. Seems these thousand days. percent. But he's certainly up there in, in that, in that realm of like the, like the elite create something at a nothing level of passer. I think as like specifically as like a live dribble with either hand mm -hmm. hitting guys that are a lot of times like cross court in the corner, two and three passes away and like passes that are on a rope and that are right where the guy needs it to be. Like these are like in the pocket passes. I think it's just it's that those are really, really hard passes to make. And I think that when he gets discounted as just kind of like a, a, a shoot happy guy who 
doesn't play winning basketball. It doesn't take into account the skill that he shows sort of across the board on that end of the floor. Because I, I, I don't think he's just a losing player. I think in the right context and, and hidden in the right ways defensively, like I think it could work on a team that, 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 that wins some things. And so it, it, um, how much does the me being from Oklahoma have to do with this? Probably a little bit. <laughs> the but what you know what's funny about Trey is like everybody was so, all the all the OU fans. I'm a I'm a I'm a Oklahoma uh, Sooner fan, and all the OU fans I knew whenever he signed, it was just like this is great, like hometown boy, like came home, this is awesome. And OU themselves started off so so hot that year, like they went. Early in the season, they went up when like Wichita State was ranked like second, and just beat the brakes off of them. And you know, like they they really really looked good for the early part of the year. Then I think Trey got a little bit too big for his britches, and things just kind of devolved from there. It got to the point where they almost didn't even make the tournament. They do, they get beat the first round, and that was it was. Uh, a real slog in the second half of the year. And it seemed like he probably wasn't too fun to play with at different points. You know what I mean? Like there's, he still has some stuff that he's got to work out in terms of like his own malleability and being a guy that is, that is fun to play with and that you want to play with, like beyond just getting some cool passes from him every now and again, you know what I mean? Like, and so it, it, uh, it, I'm not ready to, um, you know, call him like a perennial um, bad numbers or good numbers, bad team guy or anything right. like that. Because I, because I think like there's, I see too much from him offensively to give up when he's still this young. And when it does feel like he's only going to get smarter, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. it, it, he's very competitive and it, and he does, it seems like he does want to win. You know, it's not like a he doesn't seem content with just the numbers. So that's my long winded answer. But there's definitely a, more than a dash of Homer in there for sure. That's OK. I, I what the phrase that I'm, I'm having in my brain is like humanist Homerism. Okay? I, I, I don't even know exactly what how we define <laughs> it, but we're, we're going to move toward a definition of that's humanist great. Homerism on this show. Um, my I think that you're right to be maybe higher than some of the, you know, basketball consensus on Trey Young. Like, then again, I watched him dismantle the Knicks and dismantle the Sixers defense and dismantle the Bucks defense until he got hurt in that series and was like a guy who can do that at all three levels in a playoff series against wildly different defenses. There's something to hang on to there. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I think sometimes these these like guards that are good numbers, bad team guys, when they do get into the playoffs, they show some level of fear, right? Like they're not ready for the moment. And they man, like when, did he when, not? Yeah, and so I think that that's I think that there's something like that's a skill too. You know what I mean? And so I like that. There's I I I I have a hard time totally selling on him because of that. But that's that might be stupid of me. Well, we can be stupid in a safe place on this show. <laughs> Question the fifth: Talking about being stupid. We talked about free-flowing offense before, but right now we're going to slow it down. We're right. going to clear out one side of the floor. I'm going to enter you the ball on the block, and I want you to go to work. <laughs> Talk to me about Alexei Pokashevsky. Oh, man. My sweet boy. My, my, my sweet, sad boy. I, I, w- I had so much hope for him near the end of last year because – or n- not near the end. It was it – because was, he got – Boy, I've had a lot of sleeps since he's been effective. Man, this is sad. <laughs> a lot of sleeps. The it was he he had a he had a run before he got hurt, where when you watched him, it sort of made sense finally. It not it wasn't going to be like taking the top off the ceiling for the team or anything like that. But you could see like a guy who could dribble it a little bit shoot it a little bit in the right circumstance, pass, who could – had more than one thing he could do on offense. You could sort of see how it worked. And weirdly, he was like a good – like a great help defender at the rim. Like mm-hmm. he he was uh, way more sturdy down there than you kind of imagined he would be. And then I – I mean, 
he gets hurt. And I think he's just been victim of like the team just got really good, really fast. Yeah. And it, and less likely to be, um, experimental with some of these minutes. I mean, De- Dagnalt is still going to, is a, Dagnalt's a wild man and you won't, I, the, the moment that anybody thinks they can get a handle on rotations and things like that, he's going to change stuff up again, just in the name of tinkering and trying to figure stuff out. And, and I, 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 I like that he does, that he does that for the most part. There's sometimes where it's like last night, Aaron Wiggins didn't, I don't think he got a minute and that's a game where Aaron Wiggins probably should have played. Like mm-hmm. Lakers are running tons and tons of zone. You need somebody who's a good cutter who can shoot a little bit. Like it just would have made sense for him to play in that game. They were given uh, uh, Jing some minutes trying to after a little extended G League stint. So I think they were kind of trying to see like, okay, like let's get you some run here and see how. Oh you're no, looking. Tyler! The double team's coming in the post. Last thought on Poku. Oh no, the. I think that he's not going to be on the Thunder for very much longer, <laughs> but I want so badly for him to catch on somewhere. I love that. <laughs> Thank you for stopping me. It's all right. No, because every once in a while, we got to heat up the post. But yes. um, uh, reminder, he's 22 years old. We started this conversation with yeah. Kirby White needing some time. I you know, hold out a, a hope in our heart for Alexei Pokashevsky. Maybe we in a year, we're having the same kind of conversation about him getting an opportunity. Um Before we get uh, for a year down the line, the last, last thing we do on Divine Intervention is a weekly recommendation. Does not have to be about basketball. Does not have to be about anything we've been talking about. Just something that is good and cool you like and think other people might like. Tyler Parker, do you have a recommendation? Yes, I do. This is the one thing that I forgot to think about. Dan, I'm so sorry. What could be my recommendation? If you would like to take a minute, I can go first. You go first, please. That would be great. Thank you so much. No problem. You mentioned uh, earlier, we talked about comedy, your comedy background, and just like some of the people we've gotten to know in that world through this thing. Um, One of them that I know is Jesse David Fox, who is a uh, culture editor at Vulture Magazine, a comedy critic there. He wrote a book called Comedy Book um, that is about how comedy conquered culture and the magic that makes the comedy work. Um, And it's sort of like, it is something, the goal of the book is to elevate discussion of comedy, stand up, improv, movies, sketch, whatever, um, to treat it like a real art form. It's it's something like to apply the principles of criticism to comedy. And like, I know there's the general idea of the more you ins- uh, inspect or poke at, it's like poking the dead frog, right? That's the idea. Like the more you dissect comedy, the <laughs> deader it gets and the less funny, sure. fewer laughs there are in that. But um, if it's something that matters to people, and it's I think it is, I think I like the idea of being to being able to take it seriously and to think about it and why it works and what parts of it work and what parts of it don't work and that kind of stuff. Jesse does that about as well as anybody that I am aware of. And the book is a fantastic read. I'm almost finished with it. Right after that, I get to uh, a little blood and dancing, but um, I heartily recommend uh, if you are somebody who likes comedy of any kind uh, uh, and likes thinking about it, um, Jesse David Fox's book, comedy book uh, available wherever you get books. So uh, that'd be my recommendation for this week. Good call. That's very good. And I, I've been wanting to read that book. Um, and I think I follow Jesse on Twitter. Um, mine will be in this, in a similar vein. Uh, there's this comedian, Gary Goleman, Mm -hmm. who, uh, just came out with his newest special. It's called born on third base. He also came out with a book, which I'm wanting to read called misfit, which is about kind of his, his adolescence and, and growing up. Um, uh, in Boston. Um, but the thing that I've seen is his newest special and it's very, very good. And he's like, he's a comedian that really pays attention to, uh, the words and has spent a lot of time clearly like crafting these bits and putting bows on them and really like making it a Swiss watch with the way that everything works with everything else that's in the set. And um, yeah, I mean, it's just he, the, the, his special before this, I've been a fan of his since the, his special before this was just called the great Depression, which is on HBO and um, unbelievable that I'm not remembering <laughs> uh, this guy's name. 
um, Judd Apatow directed it. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know that guy. <laughs> what was funny is like because Judd Apatow wrote that wrote that book that was maybe called something something a dead frog. And so I thought of it, whenever you said that, I, it made me. I think there's a bunch of his conversations with comedians. But anyways, he Goldman like sort of got institutionalized and was like really dealing with like clinical, clinical, hardcore depression. And the special is about him getting out of it and, and his, mm. his, his, his experience with it. Um, it's also about his mom a little bit. who's kind of a piece of work. And so just Goldman, Goldman's comedy across the board. I think he's like one of the best guys doing it right now. Absolutely. And, and um, I don't care about it. But if people do care about it, it's it's he doesn't ever really curse that much, that's which right. never it never that's that's usually a deterrent for me. I usually think that it's kind of a crutch whenever you hear that about a comedian that that if that, especially if that's one of the first things I hear, then I get very, very worried about its quality. You know what I mean? Um, it's kind of like whenever someone's like trying to say that a guy is going to make it to the Hall of Fame and they bring up his Olympic stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know? <laughs> you're kind of like... And you're kind of like, I don't know that. Leave that, leave that further down. Don't, don't, don't let that be one of the first ones. Yeah, that shouldn't be in the lead. That should be yeah, four yeah. or five paragraphs down. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So, but, but Goldman, if you have people that d won't listen to stuff unless it's clean, he's like the ideal for that. You know, Bergazzi's good too, mm -hmm. um, but um, Goldman's really. Got some high quality. Shit, for sure. Well, that's yeah. It's, I mean, whatever gets them into the church. Right. And then it's about, you know, the, <laughs> the sermon that comes after that. But I love yes. that uh, phenomenal recommendation, phenomenal appearance on divine intervention for Tyler Parker. We're also going to make sure we recommend one more time on the way out the door, a little blood and dancing by Tyler Parker. The novel came out last year. Uh, absolutely. I cannot wait to get to get, get into it, to get into it. Uh, Tyler, if there's anything else that you want to make sure to make people aware of or plug on your way out the door, please do so now. No, nothing in particular. Got a couple things coming down the pike at the ringer that'll that'll um, probably hit late this month or early next. But nothing, nothing of consequence right now to say go click on that. You know. <laughs> well, we'll keep our eyes peeled for that at the ringer .com. What a great website. Um, that is going to do it for us here on Divine Intervention. Thank you so much to Tyler Parker for taking all this time to be with us. Thanks to super producer John Gennaro for doing all the things that he does to make this show look and sound great. If you got a minute, wherever you're listening to or watching this, please go rate, review, subscribe, rate us five stars, let, write a review, let people know about the show. It helps with discoverability and growing the show. So if you've enjoyed it, that would be really kind of you. Thank you so much for listening. We will see you again next week. Take care of yourself. You deserve it. Mm -hmm.